Welcome to the Cash Flow Project Podcast. Are you looking to better your financial situation by increasing your cash flow? Too busy to hunt for real estate deals or don't know where to start? Then you're in the right spot. Join us as we dive in and talk about investing for cash flow using multifamily real estate. Welcome to the Cash Flow Project. I'm your host, Duke Ong with Tri City Equity Group. With me is my co host, Vince Gettings. Today we have Rob Beersley on the show. Rob oversees acquisitions and capital markets for Lone Star Capital and has acquired over $100 million of multifamily real estate. He has evaluated thousands of opportunities using proprietary underwriting models and published the number one book on multifamily underwriting, The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. He has written over 50 articles about underwriting, deal structures, and capital markets and hosts the Capital Spotlight podcast, which is focused on interviewing institutional investors. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. All right. So how did you get started in your journey to earn passive cash flow? So investing and kind of the general idea of delayed gratification has always been something very important to me and something that I valued a lot. So uh, when I started out, you know, younger, uh, still in school, didn't really know what that passive cash flow vehicle would be, but I actually grew up in a real estate family. So I was immersed in real estate from, from different aspects, from uh, sales, uh, financing, construction, development. And so, uh, you know, really was kind of before I even realized it was pretty involved in real estate, um, but it wasn't necessarily a focus or anything like that. So uh, kind of later in life, when I got involved, uh, kind of circling back to investing, I started out in in the stock market, like so many people do, and quickly realized that that was a very tough game and it wasn't exactly conducive to passive cash flow. And so, of course, I circled back to real estate and found that multifamily not only is, is great as a real estate vehicle, but it also has great attributes like scalability and the, it's conducive to building a team, which is absolutely a requirement for passive cash flow. Got it. So one of the niches that you work with is the preferred equity space. Uh, can you give our audience a quick primer on what prep equity is and how it works in a typical capital stack? Yeah. So preferred equity is a, a very unique product and it's not as well known in the more uh, retail or syndication space. It's more of a sophisticated private equity product, but nevertheless, preferred equity is a uh, structured financial product that is kind of straddles the line between debt and equity. So it sits in the middle of the capital structure in between debt and equity. And it's often uh, referred to as gap financing or gap equity as it fills that gap. If, if the senior debt or the combination of debt doesn't really quite get the capital structure where it needs to be for the common equity. So to you know fully um, describe it, it is an equity investment made into the borrowing entity. So it is truly equity, but it has rights and remedies and preferences that give it a seniority in the equity um, to the to the remaining common equity, which makes it have certain debt like characteristics which include typically a fixed rate of return rather than equity, which has you know, an unbounded upside. Um, and also, as I mentioned, the priority of payment. So typically the way preferred equity works is it's the first uh, equity to be paid after the senior debt is serviced. So it's obviously subordinate to the senior loan, but it should be senior to everything else. And that gives it a nice preference of payment and also equity cushion with the common equity. So if, if there's an appropriately sized preferred equity piece, there's going to be common equity there that is subordinate. So that provides it more downside protection from a uh, cash flow perspective, as well as a, a capital event like a sale or a refi. So how does prep equity differ from mezzanine debt? Good question. So for those not familiar with mez debt, I'll quickly describe that as well. So mezzanine debt is a form of financing that is also subordinate to the senior loan and does play in that gap space. The economics of it are very similar to preferred equity, and the differences really lie in the, the structure and, the, and kind of the legal around it. So with mez, you actually are not making an equity investment, but instead you are making a loan to the borrowing entity and your collateral is a pledge of the equity in the borrower. And so the rights and remedies are a little different with MES because you can actually file a UCC foreclosure and go through that process to actually take over the borrowing entity because you have a pledge of that equity. So 
unlike in preferred equity, if there's a default, you can go through that foreclosure process. Whereas with preferred equity, it's more of a gray area. It just depends on a deal by deal basis, how it's structured. Some preferred equity is structured where if there is a default, which could be a, you know, a default, an interest default, if it's not being paid on a monthly basis or a maturity default, uh, you know, preferred equity could spring to action and not necessarily foreclose out the other equity and take over the deal, but they can have springing management rights, which allow them to, to step into action and, and hopefully remedy the situation through, uh, through management control and also default interest, which dilutes the common equity position, but you're not foreclosing the equity position. So those are kind of the biggest differences between MES and PREF, but economically they're very similar uh, in terms of the returns that they get and kind of the leverage that they are sized to. And what about tax benefits? Great point. So that's why we prefer preferred equity. Also because it's uh, typically more cost efficient to structure, more of a friendly borrowing structure, whereas MES can be somewhat uh, combative given that, that, that's, that you know, pledge of equity. But the big one point that you just brought up are the tax benefits. If you are actually making a loan, you, there's really no tax efficiencies or benefits that you can see there. But with preferred equity, even though it's a debt-like pro- product from an economics standpoint, you are at the end of the day making an equity investment. So you can get equity tax treatment. And so you can participate just like the other common equity investors in bonus depreciation and uh, you know the ongoing depreciation uh, you know, and tax benefits associated of typical equity investments. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we love multifamily, uh, it's the tax benefits. Um, so a lot of um, syndications are now offering a dual class structure. Um, so what's the difference between the preferred equity and say like the A1 shares in a dual class syndication? Right. This is a very interesting point. I'm glad you bring this up. So for those that aren't familiar, the dual class syndication structure, as I describe it, and as you just brought it up, there's an A and a B class of equity. and Basically, the A class has seniority or priority of payment, just like preferred equity. And then the B class is the subordinated common equity. And so it kind of splits up the equity to kind of give hopefully the best of both worlds for investors that are seeking different things from the investment. So if I'm a more income-driven investor, I'll invest in the class A and earn a fixed rate of return, but I'll have downside protection because I'm first in line to be paid. I get no upside in the project, but that's okay because I'm investing for income. And then on the B side, I'm more of a growth investor and I'm willing to take more risk by subordinating my return to the A investors. So I may even see slightly lower cash flows because the, there's greater income that needs to be paid out to the A. But at the end of the day, if the property performs well, the B investors get all of the upside and don't have to share it with the A. So there's you know greater benefits distributed among a smaller group of class B investors. So that's how that structure works. And it's very similar to preferred equity. It really is the, the same idea and objective, the difference being the rights and remedies. And so this is where it's very interesting. Um, and, and where when you contrast preferred equity from class A investing, it's where it becomes extremely compelling because you can achieve returns that are greater than what are offered in a class A structure. And depending on the the deal specifically, it can be leveraged to the same level or even have lower leverage, meaning the preferred equity versus class A. And then the best part are the controls, rights, and remedies, right? So when I'm investing in a class A position, I'm just one class A investor amongst many in a greater syndication. And so I have no voice, I have no say, I have no control, unlike in a preferred equity investment. For example, in a syndicated preferred equity investment, now I'm one preferred equity investor, but I'm grouped into this managed vehicle, which has rights and controls such as default interest if there's non-payment, maturity default, which may allow us to force a sale, um, you know, management takeover rights and major decision rights, you know, approving certain uh, capital expenditures, uh, uh, approving financings, transfers, sales. So it's a much more favorable structure from a control standpoint, which is unlike in the class A, you really are just a, a passive or silent investor. And what, what are some typical returns that prep equity shops uh, look for? And as I mentioned before, preferred equity is more common in the institutional space. And that would be 
uh, deals that are around 50 million and greater because preferred equity providers are looking to put out $5 million checks. Some of them have $10 million minimums. And, you know, that can be a very large deal because the preferred equity may only be 10 to 15% of the total capital stack. So in that institutional space, the returns are compressed because obviously there's, you know, larger pools of capital that have lower costs of capital and they're competing. And so the, the gross cost of preferred equity at that institutional space is somewhere around 12 to 14%. And so if you're an investor in one of those managed vehicles or in a fund that is managed by one of these institutional preferred equity providers, you know, your net return is going to be somewhere around 10%. So in the non-institutional space, there really is less availability of preferred equity capital. And that's something that we at Lone Star Capital are looking to fix. You know, we, we, there's, what we've noticed is there's very large demand in the non-institutional space for preferred equity. And in my opinion, there's a few reasons for that, right? There's typically less access to capital in the non-institutional space, right? If I'm a syndicator and I'm on my second, third, fourth, fifth deal, I may not have a really strong equity network or institutional partners that are writing me $5 million checks. And, um, and the deals that I'm doing are, are still smaller. So that space is, is a great sweet spot for us. And we're seeing very strong demand from sponsors and they're willing to pay a, a premium on our preferred equity because there really are no other options. If they are seeking preferred equity, either for reasons of getting just maximum funding from one source or they're actually looking for financial leverage, right? If our preferred equity costs 14 or 15%, but they're underwriting to higher returns, by paying us that fixed rate, they're able to actually increase their levered returns there for the common equity. So those are, I would say, you know, the range is from 12 all the way up to even 16 sometimes for preferred equity. And it's very deal dependent. And that's based on geography, size, business plan, sponsor quality. Well, also from our side of being sponsors, when we look at firms like like yours, it's like the convenience of that whole side of the company of investor relations. Like, do I want to deal with 30 people or do I want to deal with like one sophisticated, you know, person like Rob? So that that is like where that premium, because when you're underwriting, it's like, man, we're gonna have to pay, you know, pay more. It's like, what's that premium worth? And then to Duke's point, because Duke is that he sits in that seat. He's like, man, just one person that knows what they're talking about. Like, very in depth and, and could even like, you know, QA quality check my, um, my decisions it is pretty uh, powerful to have, um, you know, a, a, that tool in your toolbox. Um, so I can definitely see it on, on, from the sponsor side of how that niche you're filling is, is very valuable. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's definitely, we, we look to be a value added partner where, you know, we can provide advice on, on the deal structure, on, um, you know, the business plan. And then, you know, when the deal is closed, we don't want to be running the show. That's obviously not what we're there to do, but we absolutely are a good, um, you know, asset management sounding board and kind of a capital market sounding board. So uh, yeah, that's a great point. We, we recognize that. And same for us as when we're on the, on the principal side of our business, you know, we, we love partnering with sophisticated groups where we have one point of contact or just, you know, two points of contact and you know they can teach us something and we can grow together. Awesome, so who would Prep Equity be ideal for from both the sponsors and a passive investor's perspective? Yeah, so for the sponsor side, as I mentioned, preferred equity is really for two purposes. The first one being, you know, I'm raising $3 million and rather than passing the hat around for, for all 3 million of it to $50,000 each investors, I can go to a preferred equity provider and get, you know, let's say up to half of that. So 1.5 million from one source. Right? And that can really help kind of almost like an anchor investor and get you uh, get more raise velocity going and close that deal and get the next one going and, and, you know, grow your business faster. So that would be the first one, which is, you know, ease of access to capital. And then the second one would be from a leverage perspective, like I said before, if you found a home run deal, right, which those do still exist, but they are hard to find. But if you find a, a great deal, you know, you want to be greedy. You don't want to share those returns, share the unlimited upside with all your passive investors. You'd be better off bringing in preferred equity that's willing to accept that fixed rate of return, allowing you unlimited upside. You know, that's what's going to allow you to underwrite to higher returns and, and maximize that great deal. On the passive investor side, 
the investor that's best suited for preferred equity is, is just like that class A investor, someone who's more downside protection minded, more uh, income driven because preferred equity typically has a, a more compelling income component. It's really that simple. It would be somebody who doesn't necessarily want to invest in debt because there's plenty of debt vehicles out there that offer a similar uh, level of return, but no tax benefits. So it, it really, as we believe, you know, preferred equity can be the best of both worlds as it's right in between. It's that blurred line of debt and equity. All right. So let's talk about the last deal you were involved in as the prep equity. So how was it structured? And just tell us more about it. Yeah. So I'll use this as an example to describe a strategy that we've been doing lately, which is uh, funding COVID reserves. So hmm. as you guys may know, the, the agency- I'm excited. I'm interested. Let's hear it. <laughs> So the agencies, uh, Fannie and Freddie, in response to the you know COVID pandemic and all the uncertainties in the market, uh, you know it's their mandate to provide liquidity to the housing market. So they've done a fantastic job of that. And one way that they've you know been able to do so and remain comfortable with putting out new debt and, and refinancing and, and uh, is via these COVID reserves. And so they've been mandating anywhere from six all the way to eighteen months worth of principal and interest, which can be a big number. It can be you know, somewhere between five and maybe even up to 12% of your loan amount, which is being held back from day one funding. So that is creating a big gap in the capital structure. And that's exactly what preferred equity does very well. So just to, to give you an example on our last deal, it was something like Fannie Mae was providing a 75% LTV loan, but they were holding back roughly 7% from day one funding. So they were actually only funding 68% LTV at closing. Now that can be painful. And that's also kind of a headache for sponsors because they have to now raise so much more equity for the same size deal. Um, so what we were able to come in is at, we were able to provide preferred equity up to that fully funded loan amount of 75% LTV. So to the sponsor and to their investors, it's as if they were getting funded their full loan amount day one. And then the way the, that works is the agencies plan on releasing these funds somewhere between nine and 12 months after closing. So these are short-term investments for us as the preferred equity, but it's a great solution for sponsors uh, because when that release, when that, when those reserves are released from the lender, they'll come straight to us and they'll pay off our position. We're happy because we just got in and out on a short-term deal with great downside protection. And the sponsor's happy because they basically saw day one funding of 75% and then it just continued to be 75%. The only difference is rather than paying us 3%, we were getting more of a, you know, 10, 12% return uh, because, you know, we're, we're in a preferred equity position. So I, I think that's very much so win-win and a very unique uh, deal structure. And so that's, that's the last preferred equity deal that we close, you know, in that, in that way. And so one thing to add is this structure isn't a, it doesn't have to be on its own this way. So we can do this structure and actually are, are in the process of, of doing a deal with this COVID reserve component in addition to traditional preferred equity. So just kind of to put that in numbers, for example, you know, let's say we're doing a deal where the lender is again doing 75% LTV, but let's say they're holding back 5%. So we'll, we'll fund that gap and we'll take the leverage up to 85%. So we're, we're doing both. And that's, you know, again, same great solution for, for sponsors. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, we gotta, we gotta, me and Duke had to uh, talk about that, put that in our, our strategy. Cause we're running into that issue, um, right now with the COVID reserves, obviously like everybody else. So, uh, good stuff. Um, I'm going to switch gears here and go more into the, the underwriting stuff. So, um, we actually use your analyzer. Um, so awesome tool there um, that, that we use for all of our deals. So great, great stuff there. And as, as you built it, so what were some of the things that you saw with, cause there's, you know, 50 of them out there. What are some of the things that you saw with the, all the other um, analyzers and, and uh, things that were lacking uh, sheets that were lacking that you wanted to build your own and tweak it to how you saw that need to get done? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So definitely when I started out looking at all these different models and analyzers, I was, you know, I, I liked a lot of components of many of them, but 
I felt that there was a full product that was missing. And so, you know, there were some that I really liked, but then they were missing a key element. Uh, and then it just was a deal killer. So I would say something that's really important for a model to have to be the way that it's built is actually through monthly pro forma yeah. calculations. So it's not that a, an annual, you know, calculated pro forma is, you know, so terrible, but it just, it, it makes the calculations a bit more challenging. And so when you break it out monthly, you can get more granular and it just, uh, you know, provides that better detail. So that's, that's something that's very important. And so I found some models out there that were great, but they were only annual and I, you know, felt that was lacking. So that's important. You know, other models, um, don't have a, a refi capability, which, you know, just to preface that, you know, I think modeling in a refi into your, uh, assumptions isn't the best practice because it just introduces more complexity into the deal. And, and you're taking, you're making more assumptions than are really necessary. And so we've actually, you know, learned that the hard way we, we were underwriting some of our earlier deals with, you know, bridge loan, and then we were planning on refining and that just adds complexity, but nonetheless, it's nice to have that capability in the model just to kind of see what the refi looks like. And because investors, you know, they ask all kinds of questions and they want to see different scenario analyses. So it's, it's, you know, it's important to have those capabilities. So the other big piece of a, uh, and I would say the most complex part of a model that is, so what I'll also add is most models do everything the same, right? They all have vacancy. They all have, you know, rents and, you know, they're all plugged in very similarly. The, the, the place that they deviate the most is the way they handle the value add assumptions associated with implementing the business plan and stabilizing. Mm -hmm. And so you see people do all sorts of different things. What they'll do is they'll get really complicated and they'll say, okay, you know, this is how many units we're going to renovate per month. And this is the downtime for each unit. And they, you know, plug in these different ways. And, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to go about it. And I felt that I'm, I like to keep things simple. That's my, that's my style. So what I figured out in terms of modeling out the stabilization is, is keep it really simple. Basically you've got your in-place numbers and then you've got your pro forma numbers. And now let's decide how long it's going to take to get from point A to point B. And then let's just gradually achieve that stabilization. And so that's how the model is set up, uh, which I think is very unique and pretty straightforward to explain because investors are often asking, okay, well, you know, your current rents are $800 and your pro forma is 900. You know, when are we achieving that? How, how long is it going to take? What does that mean? And so it's very simple to say, well, in 12 months, we're going to go from $800 rents to $900 rents across these hundred units. And, you know, you can kind of break down the math and say, well, that's going to be roughly speaking X amount of units renovated per month. And the model accommodates for that by just linearly growing rents from that point A to point B. And it acts the same way for the vacancy, for the lost lease, for the bad debt. Because it's very frustrating to see a model that, let's say the bad debt is 3% at the moment, and then pro forma bad debt is 1%. It's frustrating if the model just goes to 1% day one. You know, that's just not realistic. So, so I think that's a very important key element. Absolutely. One of the best things that we, uh, we like about yours and uh, spend a lot of time on is actually the stress test uh, tables. Um, the way we have our, our dynamic is set up is Duke is our main underwriter. So he'll spend all the time inputting the data, building that, that model. And then when, once he's got a, you know, his first draft, I'll come, on, I'll come on with like a fresh set of eyes and I'll just start like kind of like poking holes and like what happens if this happens, what happens if that happens. And that way you get a fresh set of eyes on the underwriting. And then you can play like kind of like that devil's advocate of, um, you know, what happens if we have to go at, you know, 150 basis points on the exit, what, what's going to happen or what happens if we can't get, you know, 0% rent growth versus, you know, the 2% rent growth. So I love how your, um, your model has like those, those stress test tables kind of in it already. And we've added a couple, uh, also, um, but we, we spent a lot of time on that. Cause it's always like that, that downside protection of like where, at what point, you know, cause as a sponsor, you always have that fiduciary uh, hat on. So at what point, um, are we going to start losing our, our money and our investors capital as well? So we want to be really sure that on all these different, like cap rate expansion and negative rent growth and all the, and the increased vacancy that we have like a, a really good, uh, tuned in number of where we can sustain operations and still at least break even, or, you know, on the other side of it is, uh, you know, hit that home run, um, metric. So yeah, we love, we love stress testing. Everybody should be, uh, highly stressing 
your deals out, especially now with COVID, uh, to make sure that you're, you have that downside protection for, for yourself and your uh, investors. So speaking of that, um, what are you doing for right now for COVID um, underwriting or what have you been doing over the last, I don't know, what is it like eight months now for your underwriting? How have you been stress testing your deals? It's been both a function of stress testing. And like you said, it's, it's absolutely a great point spending time on the stress test because it's, you know, a good deal isn't a good deal just because it underwrites to a 16% return, right? Because all 16% returns aren't created equal and you might stress test one of those and see something you don't like and you might stress test another and it might be okay. So definitely agree with that. And in terms of COVID, what we were most focused on were near-term downside effects because we still believe long-term in multifamily. We still be, believe long-term in, uh, you know, the growth of, of U.S. markets and whatnot. So it was, it was more so focused on the, the near term of, okay, well, what if we stress going in vacancy? What if we stress um, the stabilization period? I think that's a really big one and it's easy to forget, but you know, everything's taking longer and, and will continue to take longer, right? We're projecting, or you know, the economists are projecting something like uh, you know, maybe 18 months to return to pre-pandemic levels for, for many of the, the key economic indicators. So it's a much harder thing to argue or to convince an investor and say, well, you know, pre COVID we were buying deals and stabilizing them in 12 months. We were, you know, renovating hundred units and making things happen fairly quickly. And it's hard to say the same thing today because I, I would say you have more headwinds associated with value add and, you know, are the residents going to be willing to pay a, a rent premium for updated appliances and near flooring and things like that? And uh, so it, it, things are taking longer and something that we're actually, you know, less underwriting, but more so experiencing in our portfolio are just the, the issues and struggles with uh, evictions and, and the inability to evict and, you know, dealing with promises to pay and, and things like that. And it certainly could be a lot worse. You know, I think multifamily as a whole has been very fortunate throughout this pandemic. Um, but still, there are there are those challenges. So kind of to wrap up your the question you asked about underwriting, it's really focused on the on the near term, uh, which is stress and going in vacancy and, and longer stabilization periods. Yes, which equals make sure you have more working capital at closing. That's one of the one of the things I see, especially um, with, with a lot of my students that I um that I coach for, and I'm sure you see it a lot too, is like, they just, they're, they're still using like the blanket, like two months of OPEX at closing. I'm like, that's not going to be enough. Like your, your burn rate is going to be so high right now because you're going in vacancies, whatever, you know, 20% and, and things like that. And you, you have 30 units to renovate. And like, you're going to burn through that. And in three or four months, you're going to be doing a cash call um, from your investor. That's not a position you want to be in. So understand that the, the, the cause and effect of, of these things of like, yeah, the the zero percent rent growth sucks and the extended vacancy high vacancy you know is not optimal and it's going to take longer but the other side of that pendulum is you're going to need more cash at closing to withstand that tor- uh that storm so make sure you, uh, as you're underwriting connecting those dots of not just the one side of like okay it's going to take longer it's i need more cash at closing so um on that note like what are some other uh like kind of mistakes that you see uh, newer investors make when they're, when they're underwriting. And you know, I see a lot and I'll, I'll chime in at, um, after I hear your, your points, but I just want to see what, what you see is what are the, the biggest things that maybe you can help newer investors right now, like potholes to miss. Right. So sticking on the previous conversation of stabilization, I think that's a, a big one that's overlooked at this point. You know, a lot of people are clued into the, to the big ones like rent growth and, and exit cap rate. You know, those are kind of, highlight metrics that a lot of people are looking for, but I think people are overlooking stabilization assumptions, which are actually very sensitive to the returns. You know, I I both want to focus on things that actually matter to the returns, right? And so if you change a small percentage of your closing costs, or if you, you know, have a certain contingency in your CapEx budget, it's not going to make or break your deal, but different assumptions like specifically the stabilization timeline can can have a huge impact on your returns, right? Whether you stabilize in 12 or 24 months. And so I'd say people generally overshoot how quickly they can achieve their business plan. And then to add on to that, they also don't anticipate enough vacancy during that period of time, right? So if you're going to have a combination of both, I want to rent, or I'm sorry, if I want to renovate, you know, 
10% of my units per month. Well, how are you going to maintain 5% vacancy during that same period? So there needs to be understand a better understanding of the business plan and you know where are you going to have vacancy during that period and, and how quickly are you going to achieve it? Nice. And then also, so again, for, for our dynamic, Duke is like the main, um, the, the main underwriter for the deal level. So he's doing a lot of the, the deal level KPIs, like, you know, two equity multiple 15, you know, IRR and making sure we hit those KPIs to make sure that we hit the note, the go, no go metrics where I'm more of the op, the operator of the deal, the asset manager of the deal. So I'm looking at like, okay, operation wise, what's my break even occupancy? What's my DSCR at closing? Because those are the things that are going to have ripple effects. Like if my break even occupancy at closing under the stress state of COVID or whatever, or if I'm buying a distressed asset, it's like 90%, like it's going to be pretty hairy those first, you know, six months um, that, you know, we, we have to get in there, bring expenses down and increase rents and stuff like that. So that's just one like break even occupancy is, you know, people don't even under, like they, they don't even factor that into their underwriting at all. I mean, that's a big one. Like you want to make sure you're, you know, you're paying the bills, right? And then uh, go hand in hand with that was the DSCR at closing. Like you want to make sure that this deal will cover the debt service and will cash flow at closing. Cause otherwise, like I said, your burn rate is going to be very, very high and you're going to burn through all your working capital way sooner than you think, especially if you're doing any kind of reposition or value add. Um, so those are the ones I see. And then another one I, um, I see as well is a lot of people focus way too much on like IRR. Um, like it's like the end all be all metric. Oh, it's 15% IRR. I'm like, that's just one, like that's one metric. Like you don't want to focus too much on that because it, it gives you like a false sense of security because it doesn't really give you like a risk analysis, like a risk profile of that deal. Like you can have one deal, it's a 15% IRR and it's, you know, pretty low risk. And then another one that's like a 15% IRR that's very high risk because one of them is getting a steady cash flow for, for four or five years with this, you know, decent windfall at the end with the sale. And then you have one that's like zero cash flow for five years with a big windfall at the end. Like, so you just need to know like the IRR is just one metric. Um, it really doesn't give you the timing of those cash flows. So you have to, there's a risk, you know, profile uh, associated with that. So that's another one I see is like, it's a 15% IRR or whatever, 16%. And like, you're not looking at the whole picture. Like you're losing money the first two years. Like you're not going to make it to year five. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> So anyway, yeah, those, those are just some, some of the couple that I, I see here. So um, as you're going through this, so uh, actually, I'm about wrapping up here in my questions here. So uh, some of the ones I see is, um, or for you, your like aha moment. So you you came from a back um, a background of real estate and uh, everything like that. So have you had any like aha moments of underwriting where you're just like, it just like things just like clicked for you that you're like, man, I've been doing this for five years and I never saw this before. And it was right in front of me the whole time. Like, have you had any like those, those uh, instances? I totally have. And I, I just had one recently and I can't remember what it was about, which, which is totally unfortunate, very unfortunate, but it is, uh, it, I, I really see what you mean where you're looking at something and you're looking at the same thing over and over again. And and then you finally see it in a different way and you, and it really clicks. Um, and I think you can absolutely expect to have those same ahas if you just underwrite enough deals and, and look at enough opportunities, you know, that the, that new and deeper understanding are, are absolutely going to click in. So unfortunately I can't think of, think of one, or at least I can't think of the recent one. I would say definitely, you know, one of the understandings or ahas is the one that you brought up in terms of IRR. Uh, and to to provide more color to that, if you if you see a high or if you see an IRR, but with a with a, a very high equity multiple and that you're not used to seeing, because typically a 16% IRR is going to be getting you somewhere close to a two per two x equity multiple. But if you see like a 16 IRR and and a closer to 2.5 x multiple, what that means is all of the return is weighted to the back end, right? Because you're getting more cash flow on a gross basis, right? Two versus 2.5x, but those cash flows in the future are discounted back to present value via the IRR calculation. And so that's that's to your point of, you know, when I see that, I'm thinking, oh, wow, well, we're really banking on kind of the, the future five years out or, or where, however long out. And so it's absolutely right where, there's some deals that I could describe to you and a 15% return would be a home run, but there's other deals 
that I would tell you that, hey, if you're going to be cash flow negative, like you said, for the first two years, you know, 15% IR is just absolutely not adequate enough for that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's being able to talk to it because it is a kind of a complicated thing to kind of break down and chunk it down. But once I, once they get it, they're like, it, you know, they can, they see that click, like, you know, look at the the bigger picture. All right. So my, my last question here is I wrap, uh, wrap up my, uh, my line here. So, you know, in, in today's market, which is crazy, cause it's like, everything's still pretty hot. We're still in a seller's market, but then there's a COVID mix into it. So are you still finding deals? Um, have you changed your strategy for deal sourcing um, for your personal uh, company's portfolio? Or are you guys going to take a sideline and just see what the next quarter or two look like before you jump back in? Yeah. So we re- we remained active in sourcing throughout the whole pandemic. So, and that was you know, both were looking for opportunity, both were just trying to learn more about the market and understand what was happening. And uh, yeah, yes, it was very difficult to find good deals pre-COVID and it's still very hard to find deals post-COVID. And I'd argue probably got a little more difficult. You had some good things happen in terms of valuation. The main one being that interest rates went down, at least permanent financing costs went down by about a hundred basis points, which do a whole ton to propping up, if you will, valuations. And then on the operational side, I would say, you know, there's NOI growth is less uh, certain and, you know, business plan implementation is less certain. So you have headwinds on the operational side, but on the capital markets valuation side, you know, things have gotten a bit better, at least on the debt side. So in total, I would say, you know, values have maybe declined 5% or so, uh, due to all the things that have happened, which is not much at all, actually. So so definitely deals are still out there. And one way that we've switched our uh, focus a bit is, you know, one being a big switch, which is adding the preferred equity structure or the preferred equity strategy, which, you know, we had our eyes on it and we wanted to launch that platform. Um, this was about a year ago. But we just never did it. We were busy. But then once we saw the capital markets changes due to COVID, you know, right? Lenders pulling back on their leverage, lenders asking or requiring these COVID reserves, you know, those we just saw as too big of reasons for us not to get in, involved in the preferred equity side. But in terms of actual acquisitions, we're also focusing more on core plus strategies, which would be characterized as lower risk, more of an emphasis on cash flow, better location, better asset quality, you know, basically just take less risk where we can and still achieve modest returns, like acceptable returns. So rather than swing for the fences right now, which is very difficult to do for, for a few reasons, right? It's harder to implement a value add plan. And also the big one, and it's getting better now, but the big one was, you know, only a few months ago, that bridge debt was so expensive and so challenging to get. You were seeing leverage being pulled back on bridge loans from 80% of cost to 75, even 70% of cost. And, and the cost of that capital was, is substantially higher than permanent debt. So when you see such a large delta between the cost of permanent financing and, and uh, you know, short-term or transitional debt, it really just makes it very challenging to want to take on something that's truly opportunistic or distressed because you need such a strong return to justify the, the higher cost of the, of the capital. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now for any kind of value add plays, um, what kind of stabilization assumptions are you coming in at and like what kind of rent growth are you looking at? Yeah. So the rent growth, we typically underwrite between, you know, typically 2%. If we love the deal, love the market, then we'll, we'll push that to 3%. And the, uh, the stabilization timeline, I would say is kind of on the low end 12 months. And this, and it's also very um, unit count dependent, right? If we're talking about a 30 unit deal, then you could stabilize that much faster. But, you know, typically we're talking about 150 to 300 unit properties. And so it, and also it depends on your business plan. Are you actually looking to programmatically renovate every interior? Then you need to account for that, right? In your stabilization timeline. But in any case, just due to COVID, right? We're going to slow things down, stress the going in assumptions and you know, do a minimum of 12 months as we kind of stabilize and burn off that the in place uh, exacerbated vacancy as an example. Got it. All right. So as we wrap up and head into our fire round, um, what is the best book that you recommend other than your own? <laughs> That's a good one. So 
I would say in terms of kind of staying on this topic of multifamily and private equity, um, a really great book is called Investing in Real Estate Private Equity by Sean Cook. Uh, that, that book is just fantastic. Um, I'm definitely due for a reread because I keep recommending it, but it's been a while since I've read it myself. So uh, yeah, that book goes into a lot of these really good principles and ideas about um, selecting a sponsor, selecting a market, selecting a deal strategy, and kind of more about the risk side of the equation, which I think a lot of people don't spend enough time thinking about it. And there it is. Yeah, it's an excellent book. Um, what is your superpower? Oh, wow. My superpower, I would say, you know, one of my superpowers, especially, you know, as it relates to the, the great discussion that we've had today is taking complex topics and ideas and, and simplifying them down and making them much more uh, accessible and teachable. All right. And what is the biggest lesson that you've learned over your career? I would say, and this plays into one of my weaknesses, which I, I need to do a better job myself and lean on others on doing better due diligence. I think, you know, uh, due diligence is something that you cannot do enough of. And so that's something that if you haven't learned it, you know, yet the easy way, you're going to learn it the hard way. So it's just ideal if you can learn it the easy way. Definitely. Or just get a partner that's really good on that. I'm, I'm, I'm big into the idea of focus on your strengths and, and find partners that compensate for your weaknesses. Um, for example, Duke is, you know, he's got the, the very data-driven mind and he, he can do underwriting and I'm pretty good at underwriting, but he is on a whole nother level. Um, so yeah, he just sent me your book um, and, and the Sean Cook book that I was just showing you. Uh, to help me up my game because uh, we're always pushing each other to improve. So on that point, of, like, uh, I'm big on partnerships of, of trying to find people that will push you and will compensate for your weakness. So if I'm not, if I'm not that good at uh, due diligence and, and like physical stuff like that and project management, I'm going to find a partner that is just a rock star at it rather than uh, me trying to kill myself. I'm just going to focus on what I'm good at. That's just me though. No, that's a great point. So for the busy working professional working towards financial freedom, what advice do you have? I would say aggressively build your portfolio and invest in things that don't consume your time. Because I think a lot of people, uh, you know, if you're a busy professional and you're a high earner, you work really hard and you respect the money that you make. You know, you likely or hopefully aren't blowing it on things that don't really bring you value. And, but that sort of mindset can be a fault, right? I see some very wealthy people doing things that are low level activities that they should be automating, outsourcing, delegating, um, but they do it because they're trying to save money. And so, you know, for example, you see some people who are, you know, wealthy and they're very busy and, you know, they decide to buy a single family house and rent it out. And they also use no debt on their single family purchase because they think that's the right thing to do. It's safe. But then they're, you know, they work, they work and they make so much money in their main skill set, which is their, their job, but they're now busy with, you know, toilets, tenants, and termites. And that doesn't serve them. So I would say, you know, don't do everything yourself and you can get leverage through a team. And that's kind of, you know, what we all on this call do which is provide other people the opportunity to partner with a team that can, you know, really supercharge their returns and take their uh, capital and have it work for them. All right. And if people wanted to check out your model and uh, learn more about your underwriting uh, methods, uh, how can they do that? Yeah. So the best way to, like you said, get your hands on the model and learn more about, uh, you know, what we do at Lone Star Capital and, and, and some of the things that I do as well in terms of the book I wrote and, um, you can head to robbeardsley.me and that'll have everything from the download to the free model, um, you know, link to my book, uh, link to other podcasts and articles um, that I've been you know, able to contribute to. So great place to start. And if you want to reach out to me directly, you can do so by emailing rob at lonestarcapgroup.com. Also the newsletter, right? So I saw, um, I don't know, are you still doing the newsletter? Cause you, you ran some oh, yeah. pretty good articles. Yeah. So the newsletter is great too. You can go subscribe to the newsletter. Um, some definitely, uh, high level, uh, stuff there. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me.
Hey, Duke, that was an awesome show with Rob. Um, been trying to get him on for a while, and he's a super busy guy. Uh, definitely fanboyed a little bit because his, his content is absolutely great. Uh, he said $100 million in assets under management or deals done. Uh, absolute rock star in the, in the industry here. Uh, some of the big takeaways that I got was uh, using, uh, you know, creative deal structures and financing like like his prep, uh, the prep equity firms like Rob's uh, Lone Star Capital to get deals done, right? Just another tool that investors have in their tool belt uh, to get deals done, right? We can do JVs, we can do syndication. Now we can add another one of prep, prep equity firms. Um, so it's always as, you know, as a deal sponsor, as a um, syndicator, you're always looking at creative ways. As an entrepreneur, you're always looking at creative ways to add value and, and get deals done. Uh, so this is just another one of those tools that are out there that we can be aware of. Um, so when the right deal comes along, we can test it to see if this this model works. And if it does, pick up the phone, give Rob a call, and and get something done real um, for us and our investors. So uh, also, I took away the um, key tips in underwriting for success. I mean, we're talking about uh, things like break even occupancy, DS, uh, DSR, things how like IRR is not the end all be all um, metric that people think it is. Definitely calculating. Uh, you know, his big hit, hit um, uh, hard hitting one was definitely be be hyper attuned to things like break even, uh, not break even, um, stabilization periods. Th those things that minor adjustments will have huge effects on your five-year performance. So focusing on those. And then also under, uh, his underwriting was, you know, breakdown by month, right? You always want to build your performance out by the month and not by the year. Cause it, but if you do it by year, it gets very misleading on what your actual performance is going to be. Um, so you having it broken down by month is, is very, very helpful when you're building business plans and you're looking at actual milestones in of the execution of your business plan. So Awesome things there. Um, also, pretty excited about his uh, COVID reserve funding. Um, you know, me and Duke's, uh, you know, ears poked up a little bit just because that is such a big hurdle that people are dealing with now. You know, you have to you have to come up with uh, maybe half a million dollars, or a million dollars, or two million dollars for uh, a deal for the down payment, and then have to come up with another two, three hundred thousand dollars for reserves that just get locked away in some kind of impound, um, impound or escrow account for an entire year or however long the the lender. Agrees. So having a solution uh, for that is going to be huge, huge value add uh, to deals uh, in the space right now as we're going through these uncertain times. So um, also, and I want to plug his book again, uh, definitely get his book. It's a short book, hundred about a hundred pages, um, tons of great information and you can read it in a day. Uh, and then also check out his newsletter. I love his newsletter, um, high level content really talks, you know, breaks down, uh, big concepts into manageable chunks and also just goes down and like deep dives into um, things uh, like, like prep equity and, and other niches like that uh, or deal structures and, and GP promotes and really gets uh, deep into those conversations. Um, so definitely a lot of value in the content he puts out as well. If you're interested in learning more about passive investing, go to tricityequity.com to download our free guide. To connect with like-minded investors, join our Facebook group, Honolulu Multifamily and More. And if you found value in this podcast, please subscribe and give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you know anyone who might resonate with today's podcast, please share the episode with them. See you next time.